Let's sing that as a cry of praise. to be in the Lord's house today, aren't you? I am thankful to be to gather together and worship the Lord with you today. Nothing compares to gathering with God's people to worship. I welcome all of those who are worshiping online with us. We're thankful that you can do that. I encourage you to get your Bible slide up close and sing with us and pray with us and worship with us. But I'm telling you, friends, nothing compares to being in God's house with God's people and worshiping, not because we're here, but worshiping because he is here as we gather in his presence and worship today. And I am so glad that you are here. If you're a guest or a visitor today, we're thankful that you're here. You can find in the pew in front of you an information card that you can fill out, leave on the pew. When you leave, let us know you're here. If you're worshiping online, you can go uh, to our, either comment on our Facebook page or go to our website, click the connect tab, and let us know that you're worshiping with us today because nothing compares. Can you imagine what it must sound like to God? To hear in his presence the sound of his children acknowledging he is the Lord God and his son Jesus Christ 
is our Savior. He's not only our only hope. He is our absolute hope. And I'm thankful we can worship together today. Giving is an act of worship. I hope you'll take advantage of giving opportunities, different platforms we have to allow you to give. Because Jesus Christ has given, he's given us the ability to give, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that. But friends, nothing compares to gathering in God's presence and acknowledging who he is and what he's done. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so very much for today. Thank you so much for today, for the health and the strength that you've given to each one of these who have come together today to worship you. Lord, and we all come from different places, different backgrounds, different experiences. We all bring with us, Lord, you know the hurts, the heartaches, the trials. You know what's going on in our lives. You know everything about us, but God, we are so thankful that we can come into this place and acknowledge that you are the Lord God. You're the only God. And that you've made yourself known to us in the person of our son, Je your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you so much for your presence here through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, today we give our worship to you. Would you now so make us aware of your presence that we'll be changed? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Worship with us this morning.
good to hear you worshiping the Lord together. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. I know we introduced a new song to you several, several months ago now, and uh, it's just right out of God's Word, and it talks about the Lord's uh, mercy being renewed, and uh, the name of the song is His Mercy is More. And so I hope you'll sing along. You'll catch on pretty quick if you don't know it. But aren't you thankful that His mercy is more? His mercy is new every day. And so let's sing that together, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Thank you so much for this time that we can gather together to worship and praise your holy name. And Lord, we continue to pray for all around our country and our world that are struggling. And God, our desire is just to lift you up today and to worship you. I pray that no matter where people are today, no matter what they're facing, they can turn their eyes to a Savior and praise your holy name. Lord, continue to speak to us now through the powerful preaching of the Word of God. And we'll
we'll be sure to give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's church shouted. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Turn with me your Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews. And as we gather together to worship day, I thank you for um, just a warm embrace to, to come back and be able to worship with you. But I do want to say thank you. Our church is blessed with an outstanding church staff. And for them to not only do the things that they routinely do to lead us and help us to know the Lord and serve him more faithfully, but then to step in and to fill in the gaps and to take care of responsibilities and those things, thank you guys so much. And, and it's not just thank you. It is thank you for loving the Lord and for serving him and being in this place. And so I thank each one of them for, for their folks. And I thank you for your faithfulness to support them, but more importantly, to be in your place and to serve the Lord. You know, the phrase that I keep repeating that many of us have, have said or heard and you'll keep continuing to hear is, you know, these are unprecedented days. Who in our wildest dreams would ever have imagined we would have experienced the things that we've experienced as, as a culture, as a church, as a nation in the last six months? And I know that people are, people are waiting for a conclusion. Friends, I'm going to tell you, you think it's bad now, it's only going to get worse. That's the reason you need Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Because whatever you've experienced, no matter how good it is or how bad it is, nothing will keep you for eternity except salvation in Jesus Christ. So what are you waiting for? We're waiting for something to happen. Well, I've been waiting for today because I've been waiting for the opportunity to feel better so that I could be back in my place doing what I feel like God's called me to do. We're all waiting for something. We're waiting for an election to take place. We're waiting for a, um, an antidote uh, to, to, to cure our virus. We're, we're waiting for our health to get better. We're waiting for our babies to be born. We're waiting for them to graduate from high school. We're waiting for them to get married and start having their own babies and start the process all over again. We're all waiting for something. You know, First Baptist Church of Social Circle has a rich, rich history. And down through the years had some wonderful, some faithful servants to serve as the pastor of this church. One of those was a gentleman named Milton Wood. Milton was the pastor when this facility was actually built over 25 years ago. Anyone who's ever been to a funeral in the social circle Walton County area where Milton Wood was the pastor, you'll know that there is one phrase he has repeated over and over and over so often I can remember it. And here's what he says. Whatever you're going to do with your life, you better get on to it because it'll be over before you know it. What are you waiting for? Waiting for our health to get better? Waiting for our conditions to change? Or waiting for eternity? I'm waiting for Jesus Christ to come, aren't you? Just waiting, biding my time, doing the best I can, waiting until he comes. Because, friends, he's the only thing. He's the only one who can solve these problems. He's the only one who can bring resolution to the different things that are going on in our world today. So what are you waiting for? Hebrews chapter 6. Now, I know some of you are anticipating our pastor's been out for a few weeks Oh, I'm sure he has prepared immensely for coming back. I, I've been joking with people all morning. Y'all buckle up because one of two things is about to happen. Either I'm going to get real excited and we're going to be here a while, or I'm going to get tired in a minute we're going to be done. All right? It's going to be one of the two. Um, I, I couldn't think. I was so fatigued, I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate. I had all these grand dreams of all these books I was going to finish reading, all these sermons I was going to write, all these things I was going to, but I couldn't think until, oh, a few days ago, I simply went back and said, okay, Lord, here's what I've been reading. What do you want to say to me? And here's what he said. What are you waiting for? Hebrews chapter 6. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? Hebrews chapter 6. We've been journeying through uh, the book of Hebrews um, uh, for just a few weeks uh, before our break, before my break. And, and I want to go back to it because I believe Satan wants us to miss this, friends. He, he wants us to miss the teaching of God's word because of the preparation that it brings to our hearts and minds. So listen to what he says in Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, let me back up to verse 14 of chapter 5. Solid foods for the mature, 
who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let's press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful uh, to those uh, for whose sake it's also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. But, beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you and the things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking to you in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name and having ministered to and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you'll not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves. And with them, an oath is given as confirmation as the end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with a faith so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge, who would have a strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor for our soul, a hope both that is sure and steadfast, one which is enters within the veil where Jesus is entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Pray with me. Lord, thank you so much just today for another day to open our eyes and live on this earth. God, we look forward to heaven, and I know I brag about you, and I say I'm looking forward to your presence, but God, this is what we know. Thank you for another day to live life on this earth, but God, help us to remember that our best life is not on earth. It's in your presence. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The letter of Hebrews is written to a group of believers who were enduring intense persecution. They were beginning to think that instead of following Jesus, that they would have it better if they turned back to Judaism. And if they did that, then the persecution that they had to endure would come to an end. Now, many of the issues facing our world today are the result of the same mentality. I, I don't want to endure persecution, so what can I do to minimize that? Somehow, our world has been led to believe that if we accept a lessened view of marriage, we'd be considered open-minded and we'd be accepted by people. We also believed that if we affirmed homosexuality as acceptable, then we'd be seen as loving and we would be accepted. We were led to believe that if we affirmed a woman's right to choose, then we'd be viewed as empowering women, and we would be accepted. We've been led to believe that if we accept the responsibility for the oppression of every other ethnic group in the world, all while ignoring personal responsibility, then we would be forgiven, and we would be accepted. My friends, none of that is true. Any compromise to what God calls sin separates us from God. And it will not lead to less persecution. It will not lead to happiness and prosperity. Separation from God only leads to death and destruction. It only leads to hell itself. It'll never be enough to satisfy the sinful desires that dwell with each one of us. Over the last three weeks, you've heard some great sermons. You have heard a sermon that explained to you what it is that Jesus actually does when you get saved. You have heard why Jesus is the only one who can provide that salvation for you. And you have heard the response to that is then to live 
in faith, not in fear. The writer of Hebrews is writing not to condemn them, but to warn them of the consequences of trying to turn away from that stuff that's hard and go back to something else, compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. He writes to warn them about turning away from the only one who can keep them safe and healthy and happy and prosperous. The words of this passage are just as true in 2020 as they were the day they were written. Because salvation, safety, security, healthiness, happiness, peace, and prosperity are only found in Jesus Christ, nothing else. And how can the world, how many more tragedies do we have to endure before we figure it out? Nothing we've done so far has worked. Nothing humanity has created or produced has provided eternal life. Now, during this time, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm on my computer and I'm, I'm Wikipediaing everything. I'm trying to study and read. Every, every bird passes over, I Google in, what's that kind of bird? And I'm chasing rabbits all over the place. And, and I simply, uh, I, in reading all the different approaches to life and how to solve our problems and different religions and what their perspective is. Friends, nothing we can create or ever has created can give to us that one thing that we all want. And I guarantee you, I know what everybody in this room ultimately wants. We want to live. We want to live. Are you afraid to die? No, I bet you a dollar you are. Oh, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of death. Tell that to the person laying on the deathbed. You know why? Because the Bible says death is our enemy. Jesus, actually a, a shepherd boy said it this way. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what, you Bible students? I will fear no what? Evil. Death is our enemy. We want to live, and nothing we've created so far can give us eternal life. Only what we believe and what we receive can give us eternal life. And that is the salvation that's purchased through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Hey, it sounds like I'm going to get wound up instead of getting tired. What do y'all think? <laughs> Listen, I want to make three simple points this morning. From our passage, first of all, I simply think that we're at a place now where we need to acknowledge the danger. In verses 1 through 8, listen, listen to this translation. So let's stop again going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let's go on instead and become more mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start over the fundamentals of importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing your faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. And so God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. But then there is the warning here is the danger. It is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were, once were enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word of God, the power of the age to come. It is impossible for those then who turn away from God to come back. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God. Listen to this. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. When the ground soaks up, a falling rain bears good fruit for the farmer. It has God's blessing. But if, if a field bears thorns and thistles, it's useless. And the farmer soon condemns it and burns it up. What is the danger? You know, throughout this pandemic, we as a church staff and as church leaders, we have tried to respond in a, in a very, to a very real danger in our world. We've tried to respond in a responsible and in an appropriate manner. We've tried to do all the things that we are supposed to do to keep people healthy and safe. But we have also tried to do it in such a way as to not let the fear of the danger keep us from living. We, we've tried to do it in a way that we've not let the fear of a very real danger keep us from worshiping and serving, and doing what God wants us to do. The simple truth, friends, is if Christ is not your Savior and Lord, then you're in danger. You're one breath away from eternal separation from God. Friends, we'll never be safe if we reject Jesus Christ. We'll never be safe 
if we're spiritually immature. We'll never be safe in our lives if we keep on living as lost people claiming to be saved people. Saved people are different than lost people. What's different about them? First of all, saved people have a hope and a future to look forward to. Lost people don't. Saved people produce what God wants. That's the rain that falls and soaks up and produces good stuff. Lost people can't take advantage of that. We'll never be safe in our lives today if we keep on living something we say we believe, but there's no proof and there's no fruit. Listen to what James said in James chapter 3, verse 13 following. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your heart, don't be so arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom that comes down from above is, the wisdom that does not come down from above is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is every disorder and every evil thing. But wisdom that comes from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering or without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who are able to make peace. Following Jesus Christ requires us to acknowledge the real danger, but live according to the will and the wisdom and the purposes of God. The writer of Hebrews speaks to the danger of those who have been enlightened or those who, or spiritually speaking, have been brought from darkness into light, but then choose to live as if they're in the darkness. These are people who've experienced the free gift of salvation and the joy of knowing freedom from the guilt of our sin. And our sins are forgiven, but then they grow cold and they wander back into the embrace of those sinful things. People who've experienced the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit operating in their lives but then choose to deny the Holy Spirit and do what they want to do instead of what God wants to do. People who have heard the gospel and heard the principles of the scripture, but then chosen their own watered-down theology. Read God's word and say, well, here's what I think it says. My friend, it doesn't matter what you think it says. It doesn't matter what I think it says. What matters is what it says. And I'll tell you who tells us that. Holy Spirit does. It's important that you and I recognize the danger that exists in our world today. God will never bless and bring fruit from a person who says they believe, but everything else about their life denies it. We say we believe in Jesus Christ. We say we believe in the gift of salvation, but then all we do is fuss and fight and bicker. All we do is try to water down what it says so it will feel better about what we're doing. All we want, listen, I think we're in danger. If we want to be accepted by the world more than we want to be accepted by the God, we're in serious trouble, friends. Because you know what? Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to eternal destruction and many We'll go there. And then he said, by comparison. And the King James says, straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to everlasting life. And then you know what he says? Few are going to find it. Now, we are worried about the many instead of being the few. You remember what the Marine motto used to be the Marine Corps the few the proud the Marines how about this the few the saved the followers of Jesus Christ we have to acknowledge that Christ has died once for all that's what the writer of Hebrews says Christ has died and those who want to turn back are nailing him to the cross all over Again, listen, friends, when we sell it, when we willingly choose to sin, the writer says it's as if we crucify Christ all over again. Sin is anything that is contrary to the will, to the purpose, or to the commands of God. Sin is dangerous. Sin is deadly. Sin is what separates us 
from God. Because of what Jesus has already done, we have been forgiven, but that does not mean that we are now forgiven and we're free to choose the level of sinfulness that we want to live in. Sin separates us from God. We have no license to sin. Sin is an offense to God, and when we call ourselves Christians and we choose to disobey, you can only be one of two things. If you're a Christian, you're either a rebellious Christian or you're lost. You can't, there's only two choices here. If you're living sinfully, in, if you're living outside of what God's Word teaches, if you're living outside of what His Spirit compels you, it can only be living in rebellion or lost. What kind of good ground would you compare your life to? Is it good ground, good soil that God's cultivating and bringing forth good fruit? Or is your life some, every time you turn around, it seems like your life is filled with thorns and thistles. Could it be God is not necessarily the one who's causing all the chaos in our lives to get our attention? Y'all ever heard that? My mother used to teach that. God will do whatever it takes to get your attention. You know, in my little Mill Village brain, let me tell you what that meant. God will do whatever it takes to get your attention, even if it means kicking you in the shin. That's what I always interpreted that as. What I really now believe is God will do whatever it takes to get your attention. And you know the worst thing God can do to you? Let you go. Let you go. You want to you go your way? I don't want you to, but go ahead. That's the worst thing he can do, let you go. My friends, we have to remember what Jesus said in Matthew 13. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word, and it produces a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as already been planted. We simply need to, first of all, acknowledge a very real danger that exists, not only for the lost world out there, but for the saved world in here. Be careful that we don't seek a compromise that leads us away from God's word. Second thing is, remain diligent. Look at verse 9. But beloved, and this is a different translation, beloved, we're convinced of better things for you, things that accompany salvation, even though we're speaking like this. For God is not so unjust as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. We desire that each one of you should show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you won't be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. The writer of Hebrews says, we're confident that God means better things for you because of your salvation. You and I must remain diligent. Are you diligent about your salvation? By God's grace, do you remain committed to do what God wants you to do for the rest of your life, no matter what the pressure? You know, the most recent controversy in California has to do with the gathering of the church and the government's perspective that in order to, to keep you healthy, you cannot meet. That's balanced by a biblical perspective that says, but God requires his people to meet. Which is safer for us? Is it? I don't want to be irresponsible. I'm not saying y'all just ignore all the health protocols and roll the dice. I'm not suggesting that. But the, the debate seems to be, how diligently will we be? Where will we seek our safety and our security and our authority? Will it come from the government? Will it come from people like me? Can you all imagine what this word would be like if I got elected to an office? <laughs> We'd be, you think we're in trouble now? I'm, I'm kind of a goofball. I don't know telling what kind of trouble I'd get us into. We're going to trust those people Instead of the one who created everything that exists, we're going to choose to follow their instruction rather than the God who created your body. And he knows best how your immune system works. He designed it. He created it. He knows what works. He knows what will kill you. But he also knows what will save you. Who are we willing to listen to? Where do we get our authority? Are we going to be diligent? You know, God, I don't want to be irresponsible. And I'm going to prove to you how I'm not going to be irresponsible with this. Not because the media says or the politicians say, wear this. I'm going to wear this because I don't know what I still have left over. And I don't want to expose anybody. But I'll tell you this, I'm here, aren't I? You're here, aren't you? We'd rather be where God wants us to be than living, hiding in a corner somewhere, praying, God, please let this pass me by. We must be diligent 
We are meant to put God first and to love Jesus with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and our neighbors as self. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? You have the Ten Commandments. Go and keep them. I've done all that. What is the greatest commandment? This is what he said. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Not either or, both and. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to joyfully serve him by loving and caring and serving others. Sadly, in the modern church today, quite honestly, friends, there's some churches and there's some people who call themselves Christian who really just don't care anymore. They really just don't care. Either they've given up or they've fallen by the wayside. They just don't care. According to a Barner Research article entitled The New Sunday Morning, it's an article that highlights trends in church attendance and engagement since the nation's response to the COVID-19 virus. Two things that stood out to me in that article. Number one, one in three practicing Christians have stopped attending church during the COVID-19 virus. One in three. Where's three people? There's three people right here. One in three have stopped going to church completely. Don't watch it online. Don't worry about it. They've just given up. One in three. What kind of Christian is that? The second thing that stood out to me, when they were asked if they had attended church within the last four weeks, half of practicing Christian millennials say they have not. Half of millennials. Now, y'all know what a millennial is? A millennial is somebody younger than me. And the reason I, t- <laughs> the reason I tell you that is because statistically, people who are my age, mid-50s and older, we make up fully over half of all practicing Christians in this country. All right, so you've got 48% and less divided up in these different groups, and one of them, half of them, have stopped going to church altogether, hadn't been in the last four weeks, haven't given it a second thought. Where's the diligence in that? How faithful are we Listen, are you imitating the one who has given you the promise of salvation and eternal life? Are you choosing to follow someone with worldly wisdom, someone who doesn't believe in God, someone who's leading a sinful life, someone who's bound for hell? If you follow somebody who's bound for hell, don't be surprised if you wind up in hell. All right? Who are we following? Someone who does not know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You and I must be diligent, diligent in growing in our understanding of salvation diligent in our prayer and in our reading of our God, uh, Bible, diligent in spending time with God. Friends, it's time to turn off the TV and spend more time with God. It, I, you watched enough news now. It's time to turn it all off and focus on him and his word. It's time to be diligent in not compromising the word of God. I was listening to a, I was sitting out and Jackie said, what are you doing? I said, I'm listening to a sermon. She said, who? I said, Adrian Rogers. She said, is he back? <laughs> I was watching that sermon, and it's from the 1980s when it was the height of what was called in Southern Baptist life the conservative resurgence, and he was in the middle of all those controversial things, and he served on a group called the Peace Committee, which was seeking to find peace within these warring groups within a denominational perspective. And he tells the story, and he said that someone in that meeting said, Adrian, if you don't compromise a little bit, we're never going to get this done. And I'll paraphrase, to which he replied, my friend, there, may, there doesn't have to be a Southern Baptist Convention. There doesn't have to be a Bellevue Baptist Church. I'll say there doesn't have to be a First Baptist Church of Social Circle. He said, friend, I don't even have to be the pastor of a church. In fact, I don't even have to be alive. He said, but what I do have to do is not compromise God's word. I don't know about you, But I think we've compromised enough. It is now time to draw a line and say, listen, I'm not looking to start a fight with anybody because I believe that as Christians, we're called to love sinners. We're called to love the lost. Listen, I don't... How would we hate our target audience? We love them. We want to reach them. If I could convince the vilest sinner of the joy of serving the Lord, I'd want to do it, wouldn't you? They're the goal. But I'll tell you something. We will not compromise in order to 
get their acceptance. We must be diligent. You can choose to be diligent in your walk, in your heart, and in your devotion to the Lord. So acknowledge the danger. Commit to being diligent. Y'all know what diligent means. It means to be specifically purposeful and taskful, to stay tasked. And then finally, you and I, it's time to make a declaration. Verses uh, 13 and following. The, the example that the writer of Hebrews gives us is God's promise to Abraham. There was no one greater to swear by, so God took an oath by his own name and said, I'll certainly bless you and multiply your descendants beyond number. Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God promised. Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold it. For example, if you and I going to take an oath today, we'd swear by, I'd swear by, you're not supposed to swear by Jesus, but if you're going to swear, you've got to swear by somebody more, uh, more authoritative than you. God couldn't find anybody more authoritative than himself, so he swore by himself. We have to do that to hold them to it. Without any question that the oath is binding, God bound himself with an oath that he would fulfill his promise. And so God has given both his promise and his oath, and these two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can find great confidence as we hold on to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone there for us, and he's become the eternal high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. God made a promise to Abraham, the promise of a son. Verse 13 to, five, uh, 13 to 15, God made a promise that was certain and was sure, and God kept his promise to Abraham. Abraham waited patiently. He was 75 years old when God promised that he would have a son. 25 years later, 100 years old, Isaac was born. God kept his promise even when Abraham no longer had any reason to expect him to. God still kept his promise because God cannot lie. When God promises something, it will come to pass. It is his oath. It is his nature. It is his truth. God has promised to you and I something. Numbers 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he doesn't change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Listen, I received a command to bless. God has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. In the declarations of God, you and I have a promise. What is the promise? We have a promise of an anchor that holds. We have the promise of a hope. He is the anchor that holds us safe through the storms of life. Listen to what one poet said. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. It's fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. What is your declaration today? What are you declaring by your presence, by your actions, by your words, by your mannerisms, by your lifestyle? What are you declaring to your family that's watching you? What are you declaring to other believers who are looking to you for support and encouragement? What are you declaring to the world that doesn't even know you? You and I are called to declare to the world, Jesus Christ is the only hope you'll ever have. He is the only Savior who can forgive your sin. He's the only one who can rescue us from death and from hell itself. Is that your declaration today? Is your hope secured by an anchor? Yeah, I remember one time going out on a little John boat on the Mill Village Pond. And it's not a real big pond. It provided water for the mill, you know, all the operating, cooling the systems, whatever that's all about. And so, um, but I went out in this John boat that had a hole in it. Y'all know what happens to John boats that have holes in them? They start to sink. You know how I found that hole? I didn't see it. So how did I wind up getting in a boat that had a hole in it? There was an anchor in the back corner of the boat. Now, it wasn't even my boat. I found it. It was, it was pitiful when I found it. You know what I did? I moved the anchor. And guess what had happened underneath? The rust of that anchor sitting on that boat had rusted a hole in the boat. When I moved the anchor, guess what happened? Broke the seal of the rust, and the water started coming in, and Mike is in serious trouble. Do y'all see the obvious point that I'm trying to make here? You move your anchor, you're going down. 
Hang on to your anchor, your hope, which is Jesus Christ. I'll close with this. In our danger, we have a rescue, and his name is Jesus. In our diligence, we have a Savior that we should love and serve and share with others. In our declaration, he is the one that must get the glory. Our certain hope of our forgiveness of our sin, the health that we're all longing for, the safety and security we plead for, the absence of conflict that we desire, friends, is only found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness hides his loving face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. What are you waiting for? Pray with me. Lord, thank you so much for reminding me in my weakness and in my fear and in my failure that you are still God. Thank you for reminding me that even when I can't feel you, Jesus Christ has saved me, and your spirit is with me. Even when I rebel, and I don't act and think and do as I know I should, I thank you for the forgiveness of your son, my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray over all of those who are worshiping this sanctuary today, and all those who are watching and worshiping online today, God, they are also looking for something. They're waiting for something. God, help them to know that today, Jesus Christ is what they're looking for, what they're hoping for, and what they're waiting for. Help them just to acknowledge it, to, to believe and accept the salvation that comes by Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. Help them to cry out to you today and find forgiveness, hope, salvation for their souls in Jesus name I pray before we stand and sing every head bowed every eyes closed if you're watching uh, worshiping online keep your eyes open but if you're here today and you say pastor would you pray for me I, listen I know you don't want to do this but pastor would you pray for me today I need Jesus to save me from my sin would you just raise your hand so I pray for you anybody thank you ma'am I thank you I see you. I'm praying with you. Somebody else, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need Jesus to save me from my sin. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? If you're a Christian and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm, sometimes I'm confused. Sometimes I'm scared. Sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I'm hurt. Sometimes I'm rebellious. Would you pray for me? Would any Christian raise your hand today? Are you all too good? You don't need any prayers? Pastor, would you pray for me? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hands all over the room. I, I try to see you. I'm looking. I'm looking, I'm praying with you, I'm praying for you. Lord, you see the hands that are raised today crying out to you. Would you right now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, do what you alone can do? Save the ones who ask you, who need you to save them. Encourage the Christians who need you, the strength it takes to walk in this crazy world with you.
Answer my prayer right now today in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me as a time of response today? You've heard this week after week after week. This altar is open, and I'm just going to tell you the way I'm feeling it. I'm, telling you, I'm just going to tell you what God's laid on my heart. We all think it's okay to stand right there. I'm telling you, some of us need to make a declaration by getting down here on our knees. It is time to stop putting on a show of righteousness. It is now time to be honest and get on our knees. If I could drag you down here and make you pray, I honestly would because I believe that's the only place where salvation is found. So is there a, anybody who'd come and kneel and pray today? Uh, Kale and Jeff are going to come and stand here. They'll pray with you. But is there anybody who wants to come and kneel today and pray? Anybody? You come while we sing. I cast my mind to Calvary. Let's do what you Jesus need to do. Do you need to come and kneel and, and pray just to prove it to yourself? Me. Does your family need to see you on your knees praying for them? His hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. Sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. All right, now sing it out like you mean it. Ready? for the assurance of your presence in the hearts and lives of your people today. And God, I'm sorry if, if I've tried to stand in the spotlight, if I've tried to make it somehow about me. God, this is you. This is all about you. It is your name that's at stake, and you'll, I know your name is never going to be put at risk. God, would you help us? as a church and as followers of Jesus Christ to be, to acknowledge the reality but claim the victory that comes in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you help us to declare it boldly and courageously at a world that sticks its tongue out at us and calls us names and tells us that we deserve to be quiet. Help us to trust and seek and serve and share Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And it's in Jesus' name I pray today. All God's people, what'd you say? Amen. 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 You can be seated for just a moment while I catch my breath. Thank you for, for being here and for worshiping with us today. I do want to take just a moment and remind you that we have remained committed to our four-phased Reentry plan and our church's response to this horrible virus that swept over our nation. And in my conversations with the department, the Georgia Department of Public Health, I want you to know something. I, I'm, I'm going to brag on you because I did to them. And this representative from the Georgia Department of Public, uh, Department of Public Health, who doesn't know us, has no investment in us, 
Here's what he said to me. He said, Pastor, it sounds to me like y'all have done it right. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for taking seriously the things that we need to do. Whether you agree with it or not, thank you for taking it seriously for somebody else. And I want to encourage you, let's continue to do that for a few more weeks, okay? I encourage you, if you have a mask, please wear it. I encourage you to please practice social distance. I encourage you to use some hand sanitizer every chance you get. Listen, stuff comes by the gallons, use it up, okay? But we will not live in fear anymore. We're going to keep on. I, I tell the staff this constantly. I said, let's just keep on going. Let's just keep on going. Let's keep on going, shall we? Because there's more of them than there are us. There's more lost folks out there than there are saved folks. Let's go share the gospel with them. I am no longer interested in quantity. You know, for so long we've measured our success by quantity. We've always said quant quality, not quantity, but we really didn't believe that. We really wanted to see the numbers. Listen, from now on we're looking for life change. Looking for life change. That's the evidence of salvation. So would you pray with us? And would you be wherever you need to be, doing whatever God wants you to do? Every opportunity he gives you, pray over it and go do it if he leads you to do it. And we'll keep on being the church that God's called us here to be. Amen? Now, before we're dismissed, I do want to remind you as we're dismissed, um, please practice social distancing as you exit. Uh, don't all go to the same exit. Please use the back exits as well as the front, the balcony side exits. Go that way. But please distance yourself. As we get ready to leave, and what shall we do? Are you kidding me? After 18 months, that's all you can get out of that? First Baptist Church, what are we called to be? Let's go do it. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.